This is LSU Recon, the latest intelligence on the next Fighting Tiger opponent. Now, with the very latest from behind enemy lines, here's your host, the voice of your Fighting Tigers, Chris Blair. Welcome in, Tiger fans. It's another week, another edition of LSU Recon, where we go behind enemy lines, try to find out all that we can about the Tigers' opponent this weekend, which happens to be the Florida Gators coming to town. Take on your Fighting Tigers. Early kickoff at legendary Tiger Stadium just after 11 a.m. So get the uh, tailgate starting early, but I'm sure that uh, Tiger fans will certainly have no problem doing that. Once again, we're at our home, Cards and Culture, Perkins Row in Baton Rouge. It's the hippest place in town. I tell you that all the time. Inventory coming in, inventory going out. Uh, they've got, you know, footwear they've got clothing they've got unique items that you really can't find anywhere else in fact if you're a joe burrow fan i was told when i got in today they actually have a couple maybe one or two that's all joe burrow signed lsu helmets so uh, again i say it all the time if you've never been in come see anthony renato and his team here at cards and culture if you've been in once or twice you really could come in every week because the inventory is going to be different. Some of the greatest collectibles when it comes to LSU, when it comes to the NFL, MLB, you name it, you can find it here. And if they don't have it and there's something you're looking for, talk to the staff. They'll find a way to get it to you, and uh, I think you'll have a fun time in here. Don't forget, we're here every Thursday, and uh, you're more than welcome to come in. Uh, obviously, I could use some help, so you can come in, maybe do the show for me. Not a problem. We talk about LSU and Florida. I can t- uh, just continue to say it's the most heated and contentious rivalry currently going on in the cross-divisional games in the SEC. Yes, I know there's some that maybe have more tradition, maybe, but it's been a long time since it's really been a, a rivalry of such. Uh, Florida comes in. They are actually 17-17 and 17 in games inside Tiger Stadium. This overall series, pretty tight, 31 wins or 33 wins for Florida, 31 for LSU, and three ties. So that should tell you in the 68th meeting between these two teams, it's been uh, pretty tight. Each team has had their uh, share of wins and their share of losses. And it's my pleasure to welcome into the show to give us some info on the 2021 Gators. An old friend of mine who happens to be in Gainesville knows a lot about the Gators, and he tells it like it is. That's the reason I wanted him on here. Please welcome to the show, Seth Harp. So, Seth, one of the things I think is most fascinating this year about the Florida Gators is last year, obviously, with Kyle Trask, Kyle Pitts, uh, they were the one of the top passing offenses in the country. Those guys move on, and this year you come in, you got uh, Emory Jones, Anthony Richardson, two highly touted quarterbacks. Uh, you got a pretty good stable of running backs, and now they're leading the SEC when it comes to running the football. Uh, one of the tops in the country at that. Uh, five guys averaging over five yards per carry. So it's more about what guy's in and which guy's going to get the ball and which one's going to run most of the day. Um, I guess it goes to Dan Mullen, give him some credit, you know, taking what he has, the pieces he has, putting them together and, and building a playbook around them. Um, how surprising have you felt going from what they were doing the last couple of years to what they're doing this year offensively with the personnel they have? You know, it's interesting, Chris, because everything that they were good at last year, they're struggling with this year. Everything that they were bad at last year, they're good at this year. So it's truly a Jekyll and Hyde act. And, and what I think is interesting about it is you look at, you know, you mentioned the yardage, uh, the yards per carry. Emory Jones is leading the team in rushing yards at the quarterback position. Second on the team is Anthony Richardson, you know, backup quarterback who's seeing about, oh, 15 to 20% uh, of the action when he is in there. But Chris, he missed two games. And he's the second leading rusher on the team. And when he is getting in there, it's spotty at best. And then you look at what well, Malik Davis is third on the team in rushing. So it's one of these things that he's going with what he has, as you mentioned, the talent that he has. It's just a struggle right now for Emory Jones to throw the football and Anthony Richardson to throw the football. Shane Matthews, a former Gator quarterback, works with us here. And, you know, he points out several things. And Shane's a smart dude. Uh, He talked about how both of them aren't comfortable enough yet when it's one read, two read, rather than like third read and then cycling back through it's first read, second read, nothing's open, I'm gone. And they take off with the football. And in this day and age where you spread everybody out, if you have a quarterback that can move back there, you can pick up seven, eight yards 
uh, per carry. And I think it's Dan Mullen's offense spreading the ball out and moving the ball vertically down the field. And when that happens and you have only four guys rushing and three linebackers or whatever you may have, and now you're asking a quarterback to, to shake two linebackers, they're able to do that. So that's why they've been effective this year. Is it a long-term plan for success? No, it's not. And, you know, coming up, you know, over the course of the next few weeks, you can get away with that stuff against the Vanderbilts in the South Florida. As you saw what happened against Kentucky, who's probably a top 15 team. I don't know if they're up there with the elites uh, in, in the country, but they're good this year, not great. And you saw what happened in a game like that. And against Alabama, Alabama wasn't quite ready for that yet because they hadn't seen those two guys. So it's a different, it's a different look. And the identity that was last year is no longer the identity this year. And who knows what the future holds with this offense because it's two totally different offenses right now. Yeah, I was talking to Coach Ed Ogeron earlier this week, and, and Coach Ogeron worked with Dan Mullen when they both were at Syracuse. And at the time, Syracuse was running the triple option. And he said, hey, look, don't get me wrong. They're not running the triple option at Florida, but they have an option offense in the sense that depends on if, if Emory's going to keep, if Richardson's going to keep, if he goes to Malik Davis, uh, they can even use the pitch game out on the corner. Um, so it is fascinating the way they're using the pieces they have this year. But I want to talk about where LSU fans are most concerned, and that is against Auburn two weeks ago, albeit in a loss, a game that LSU let slip out of their hands, led until the 311 mark in that game. Then they go to Kentucky, a team that you know is going to run uh, with uh, some pretty good running backs in their own right with Rodriguez, who leads the league. Uh, Cavassier Smoke is a really good backup running back, if you will. They give up 330 yards. I want to start at the offensive line. What is it about Florida's offensive line this year? Are we got excellent running backs, or are they given – the holes in the creases to make those type of plays and average seven, eight yards a carry, and in Richardson's case, just under 15 yards a carry. That, to me, is the biggest concern, is what type of offensive line is Florida bringing to the table this weekend? I would say it's similar to what they had last year, maybe even a step behind what they had last year. You go through and you look at this team and, and how it's built and how it's structured. A lot of designed runs, as in designed quarterback draws, designed, uh, you know, five-step drop and boom, then he's off with it. A lot of RPO. There's so much that, that goes into this that Dan Mullen, and look, they have figured this out, that the offensive line isn't one of their strengths. It really, really isn't. So what are they doing? Well, they're using that to their advantage by, by not allowing the offensive line to play a role in a lot of plays. And what I mean by that, Chris, is it's – it's designed around Emory Jones and Anthony Richardson's strength. It's not your bruise them, five guys up front, let's run the ball. It's one of these things when you've got two receivers out set right, two receivers set or split tight end or whatever, you empty backfield, one guy in the backfield and everybody's spread out. It's not necessarily that penetration's occurring. It's, it's one of those things where the offensive line is just doing their job long enough for two or three seconds to allow Emory Jones to get back there. And if you can make the first defensive lineman miss, He's fine. If you ever could find a team, or if a team ever, ever, and they'd probably get upset at me if I said this, if you ever found a team that could run a standard 4-3 that would blitz safeties and blitz corners and blitz linebackers, this team would be in a lot of trouble, especially if those guys were quick. But nobody does that for whatever reason. They sit back there, and I think the logic is, we're going to sit back here, and we're going to let you throw the ball, and you're going to have to beat us with your arm which neither of these guys can do. Neither of these guys can do that. But what happens is the plays break down in those situations and they run with the ball anyway. So it's, it's, it's just weird watching because I can only imagine how frustrating it must be for Dan Mullen and, and the rest of this offense because what they're designing it to do isn't what they're good at, but he's making it work. So, you know, a roundabout way to answer your question, the offensive line isn't as good as it was last year. It's just Emory Jones and Anthony Richardson can move with the football, and you really didn't need to do that with Kyle Trask. You know, it's interesting. You kind of you kind of took uh, or gave the answer to my next question, which is, you know, LSU, uh, although depleted now, injuries really starting to rack up uh, up front, and obviously with Eli Ricks out uh, and Derek Stingley being out, those two All-American corners, uh, that makes you a little susceptible on the back end of the defense. But LSU's front four has had the ability at times, more times than not, to be able to get after people. So I was going to ask you, if you were scheming up a defense, watching Florida week in and week out, 
how do you stop them? And I guess you just told me. You just try to bring the house, get as many bodies back there, and make sure you tackle. Yeah, I, I press. Uh, with corners, I press and make whatever receiver would be out there, Copeland, whoever it would be, struggle to get off the line of scrimmage a little bit. I bring safeties. I disguise blitzes. I, I would try to confuse uh, Emory Jones as much as possible because the one thing that he does, and, and he, he's good about this, He's always good about making the first or second guy miss is what he's good at. But that's easy to do, Chris, when you're in the open field and you're running, you got a linebacker coming at you. I shouldn't say easy. Easy for him wouldn't be easy for me, but easy for him. He can make that first guy miss. That's how he picks up eight, nine yards of carry. So you have to confuse him. If you go back and watch Kentucky, the Kentucky-Florida uh, game, he was confused all night long to the point where they were running – you know, delayed draws. They were running things of that nature in the fourth quarter to try to move the ball down the field, and they weren't working, and he didn't know what to do because those always work when you spread everybody out. They had been working. They worked against Alabama, uh, but they weren't working against Kentucky. So the mode of thought there, I guess, was, okay, what do I do in this situation? If you can confuse him, then you can have success against him. But the thing is, you watch what Kentucky did with Stoops and how they brought pressure, and they forced turnovers. They forced him to turn it over two or three times. And the thing about this is he's just he's still in his first year as a starter. So when things start to go bad, they really, really snowball on him. And, uh, the, but the risk is with that, again, Chris, if you bring the house, you're going to have one-on-one -on -one coverage, and you know how that works. But if I were scheming against him, that's what i do. Alabama sat back when they got up 21-3 and said, okay, you're going to have to run the ball to beat us. And they <laughs> did it. Because they rushed for 300 whatever yards it was in that game, and that's how they worked their way back into it. So it would be one of these things, and you're going to get burned every now and then, but you also can force turnovers every now and then. I, I think if you blitzed him and you put pressure on him and blindsided him and things of that nature and pressed the corners and made him throw the ball deep, then you'd have success against him. And he probably would burn you twice, maybe three times, but you'd also get to him four or five times and make him turn the ball over two or three times as well. So it's one of those pick-your-poison. Uh, high risk, high reward, um, but also high risk, low reward at times as well. Seth Hart, my old friend, joining us this week on LSU Recon, helping break down the matchup from the Florida side. Um, hanging out here at Cards and Culture, and I thank these guys for letting me come every week simply because it gets me out of my dark and dingy studio. So this is a much better setup. Uh, as you can see behind me, the set is a lot better than when I am, uh, you know, there in uh, the studios. So um, the other question, before we move to defense, and I'll let you go, Seth, uh, you mentioned the struggles at Kentucky. Now, that's a confident Wildcat team. Uh, they put 61,000 people in at Kroger Field, back-to-back uh, -back sellouts, Florida and LSU for the first time. In fact, the sports information people couldn't even find it for me. They said, well, we, off the top of our heads, we have no idea when Kentucky sold out two SEC games back-to-back. -back. But in the Florida game, a team that, of course, prides itself on offense, prides itself on playing at home in front of a, a, a raucous crowd. 15 penalties, eight of which were false starts. Now, Saturday morning, 11 o'clock, you've got an LSU team that's kind of sputtering at the moment. I don't know that we'll have 100,000-plus there on Saturday, but my guess tells me there will be 50 to 60, maybe even 70,000. And those who are there are going to be locked in, and they don't like Florida. So it's going to be a hostile environment. Not like it was in 2019, but still hostile. Certainly as hostile as it was at Kroger Field. What did Dan Mullen and, and what did you gather kind of was the reasoning behind the struggles in, in the false starts on offense, which seems very uncommon uh, for a Florida offense? Well, they tried to go to a silent count and also a clap count. And, you know, trying to explain to Florida fans, and it's so small feet, Chris, that... <laughs> It, 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 because it's, it's tough to do this at times, that this team, a lot of these guys up front, hadn't played a road game all year. I'm sorry, with all due respect, a neutral site game down in Tampa against USF where they're the home team, that's not, that's not a road game. So this team hadn't played a road game. So when your first road game with a brand-new quarterback, two brand-new quarterbacks, and three new offensive linemen are on the road in this conference and it's the largest crowd that stadium's ever had, Chris, you and I both have been around this country and been to a lot of places. The University of Michigan seats more fans than anybody else, right, in the country. I would even have that in my top 15 stadiums in terms of noise. It's not because it's a bowl in the way it's spread out. Kentucky, the, the structure of that, you are up, you've seen it. it. It's louder in there now. So 50,000 fans or 60,000 fans in one stadium 
it, it louder in Kentucky with 60,000 fans than it is at Michigan with 100,000. Just the way things are constructed and set up. So I think a lot of people got lost in the shuffle of how many people were there. It's the deafening nature of it, right? Buffalo and Kansas City, or Buffalo Bills, I it used to be Rich Stadium, not sure what it is anymore. That's one of the loudest places in the NFL. It's not even one of the top ten in terms of attendance. So th that loudness, they were just confused, didn't know what to do, and they couldn't adjust because, I don't know if they hadn't prepared for it or thought it wasn't going to be that loud, and they got eaten alive. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I'm sure that's been a main point of emphasis. Well, I'm not sure I know it is because Dan Mullen talked about it being a main point of emphasis. It'll be interesting to see what they come up with because – you know as well as I do, whether it's noon, 4, 6, or 8, LSU doesn't like Florida, Florida doesn't like LSU. It's going to be plenty, plenty loud in there. I, I do get a kick out of there's a book to Florida, people traveling. It's like, I wish we could play them at night. I wish we could play them at night. No, you don't. You want no part of that place <laughs> at night. You, should, you, should, you just don't. That's just ridiculous. That's like saying, bring, remember, bring on Duke in basketball, or we want Bama. No, you don't. You don't want to play there at night. If you're Florida, you have the perfect setup. It's an 11 a.m. local kick. You just had a noon kick last week against Vanderbilt, so you're in a little bit of a cycle that you just got up at that time and went through it. And let's face it, Chris, it's, you know, uh, preaching the choir. There's a big difference uh, there at <laughs> Baton Rouge as opposed to 8 p.m. as opposed to noon. There just is, and that's not only there, but that's across the country that it's that way. So Florida's extremely lucky that they're getting them early in the morning. Just are. Yeah, I mean, uh, having grown up in Kentucky and having been to oh. formerly known Commonwealth Stadium, it yeah. is, and I told LSU fans on our trip up there, I said, hey, the thing about it is there's only going to be 61,000, which I know sounds, you know, it's not Tuscaloosa, it's not, you know, College Station, it's, it's not Gainesville. I said, but the way it's, it's built, it's an amplifier. And yeah. when you get that many people in there, the decibel level goes off the charts. All right, I don't want to keep you all day, and I do appreciate I, you taking time out to break this Florida team down. Let's talk about defense. Now, last year, okay. Todd Grantham, maybe as maligned as any coordinator in the country. Uh, you know, you read message boards, you look on social media, the game had passed him, he, he's he got to find a new D.C. Um, I don't believe coaches forget how to coach. Um, I know he lost a ton of really good players from the, from, from the 2019 team. But this year's defense, uh, compare and contrast. Uh, obviously, Todd Grantham uh, in every stop has been known for his aggressive nature. Uh, the exotic blitzes, you never know where it's coming from. He'll show over here, but he'll bring it from the other side. This year's Florida defense, where, where do you think they are compared to, say, the 2019 team or even before that, uh, as far as the expectations that Florida has for their defense each year? It's not those defensive units that you saw back, you know, under the Urban Meyer regime. It's not what you saw back then. It's not those Charlie Strong defenses by any means. It reminds me a little bit. They're, they're a little bit closer, and it sounds weird even saying this to what Jim McElwain had uh, about eight, nine years, or seven, eight years ago. I should say it was about six or seven years ago, where that defense was good enough, and look, Georgia was down at the time, to get Florida to the SEC title game. Now, the problem was they could slow down Alabama for three quarters, and then Alabama would open up the spigot on them in the fourth quarter. This team is it, it's not quite there defensively, but it's good. It's a good defensive team to the point that here we are, what, mid-October, not one email, not one phone call, not one tweet fire Todd Grantham, which that was all we had last year. Fire Todd Grantham, it's actually turned more to the point of maybe Dan Mullen's not the right guy for this job because 9-3 and three is unacceptable. 10-2, and two, it's SEC championship game or bust, which is just ridiculous when you're replacing six starters on offense. Only Alabama can reload like that. So I, I look at the defense and – you know, a couple guys entered the NFL draft. They had three guys drafted last year, four guys drafted, and other guys graduating. The talent's just better. They will use the uh, transfer portal to get some guys in here, and he just has better personnel. And I, I think not necessarily when you're installing a new system because Todd Grantham's been here a couple years, and last year when the offense is scoring 40, 50 points a game, you know, the ebb and flow of that, the defense just didn't need to be what it needed to be. This year it needed to be better. And I think there was such a focus on offense with Dan Mullen and everything that they had last year that the defense kind of recruiting-wise, Chris, talent-wise, was like, okay, well, we're going to beat everybody 50 or 42 to 35. Our defense is good enough to hold us in games like that. Well, that's fine until you roll into a game where your defense isn't playing well, neither is your offense, and the fog starts to roll in here on a, uh, <laughs> well, a, a crisp December night, and before you know it, well, the, the, if, it, if we didn't have fog, then no, 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 and they got themselves bit last year by doing that. The defense is better because they just have better talent. 
the offense isn't as good because the talent isn't there. So the, the pendulum is kind of flattened Lady Justice. Her scales have balanced here a little bit. The defense is good. I'd say the defense is probably one of the top five defenses in the conference. But the problem is the offense isn't one. I mean, they're running the ball well, but the passing attack's just not there. So things have evened out here a little bit. It's a good defense. It's a defense that can keep them in games against Kentucky. It's a defense that can keep them in games against Alabama. I think it's a defense. It doesn't matter what. They could have Trevor Strong's defense here, and they're not beating Georgia. But uh, structurally, it's a good defense. They can go win at LSU. You bet they can. This, Chris, is probably a 9-3 and three football team. And defensively, it's going to be a reason why they're probably a 9-3 and three football team. It's a good defense. It's a defense that can win them maybe the Outback Bowl or the... Uh, what do we call? We don't call it the Citrus Bowl anymore. Whatever. I mean, that's why I think that's what it is again. It's a bowl game. Look, they can beat a, a Michigan State like that in a bowl game, but they're they're not a top ten team. But they're a better all around football team than they were a year ago. So that's their, their defense has gotten better. It's just they don't have, you know, a, a second round draft pick at quarterback, and they don't have two first round draft picks on offense this year. It's just. That's the difference. All right, Tiger fans, we are lucky to have Florida fan favorite Seth Hart be with us here this week on LSU Recon. And by the way, uh, Seth, I think uh, I saw somewhere that uh, the LSU players are instructed this week, they're not going to lace up their cleats. They're actually just going to unlace them, make them as loose as possible, and, and who knows, expect the unexpected in this game. Last thing I have for you, <laughs> you, you love to look at matchups, um, yes. and I've always been impressed with the way you, 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 you get down to the detail and the nuance yeah. of it. Last thing I got for you, what do you see? What, what are the questions for this game? Uh, what decides who wins in a game and a matchup that uh, I just don't pay attention to records and I don't pay attention yeah. to the, the lines? It's, it's LSU and Florida. Yeah, the thing that would concern me from LSU's perspective is depth um, and how banged up everybody is. This is a Florida team that's, Chris, relatively healthy. It really, really is. I, I mean, Anthony Richardson has some issues and, you know, his hamstring, but it's, it's, it's an offense that has 10 of its starters from the beginning of the year. It's a defense that has 10 of its starters from the beginning of the year, nine, depending on the rotations. So they're relatively healthy. They, they, the injury bug just hasn't been them this year. So I, I look at things from that nature and the fact that it's an early kick and, uh, you know, Emory Jones' ability to run the ball and what, what he's able to do, I, I think there's a way to stop him. We laid it out at the beginning of this interview. I just haven't seen anybody do it uh, yet this year, with the exception of Kentucky and what they were able to do. Uh, I think with what happened here last year, I think it's going to be a good football game. Florida fans think they're blow them out. They're crazy. I think it's a game that's, you know, one of those 21-14 you know, type of games going into the fourth quarter. LSU has a shot. I, I think if, if I were a gambling man, which I am, I take LSU. Is it still 10 and a half points? I take LSU with the 10 and a half points. But I think Florida wins the football game. But it'll be a good football game. Anybody think it's going to be a blowout? It's crazy. I, I just don't know. Was Stingley and the regular starters in there? Yes. I just don't know depth-wise what Coach Owen, what this defense has uh, to go up against, you know, a first-string SEC offense, especially like a, a team like Florida. Like I said, that's probably – Chris, when we get right down to it, probably between the 15th and 22nd best team in the country, right around there. It's a 9-3 and three football team, more than likely, and I, I think just personnel-wise, LSU's just too banged up right now. All right, there he is, Seth Harp, telling us what to expect on Saturday going behind enemy lines. Seth, it's uh, good to hear from you. Good to see you. Thanks for taking time out. And uh, hope to see you over there in Gainesville whenever I get a chance to come back to one of the places I absolutely love. So uh, we'll, we'll see you then. Take care, my friend. Look forward to seeing you, Chris. Have a great call this weekend. All right. Seth Harp, everybody, our guest this week on LSU Recon. Thanks to him for his time. Thanks to you for joining us. And thanks to the great team here at Cards and Culture. We'll be back here next week for another edition. So uh, don't forget, subscribe. That way when everyone drops, a new one drops, you'll have it right there on your mobile device. You can watch it on YouTube at LSU Sports Official uh, YouTube channel, of course, at lsusports.net slash podcast. Until next week, this is Chris Blair. So long, everybody, and go Tigers. LSU Recon is a production of LSUSP and Playfly Sports. Hit the subscribe button now and never miss a new episode. You can follow Chris at LSU Tigers Voice.